I uh, started out as a boy, a young boy, in just after the Second World War. I'm born in uh, 47 in Antwerp, which had been struck quite heavily by uh, German bombardments, of course. But this is a harbor, an international harbor now. And after the Second World War, uh, Antwerp and parts of Flanders were industrialized, were rebuilt, a sort of Marshall Plan for that area. Let's say for the first time, in fact, in, in the history of Belgium then. And the result of that, of course, was that uh, people coming from uh, lower uh, backgrounds, social backgrounds, that they were um, recruited, if you like, and certainly encouraged to go and study. Uh, it was called at that time the democratization of uh, education. There was money, there were incentives, there was uh, a longer term uh, policy. And I think you can say this for the, ver for the very first time. So the result of that was, I'm coming from a, a small background, if you like, a low background, uh, in a neighborhood that is still, uh, well, a troublesome neighborhood in Antwerp. Uh, today, uh, uh, where a lot of uh, immigrants are uh, living now, today of course. And uh, the perspective, uh, that's important for me personally, I uh, think, uh, the perspective you had as, as a child then was, if you could, if you were a good student, let's say, uh, at primary school, then the perspective was at home, yes, uh, maybe he can go to uh, the secondary school, but let's not be too pretentious. That's not how we live, that's now not how we stand in, in the world. So let's be very cautious. And the next step, of course, was to have the first three years of, of uh, secondary school. And, you know, if you can re uh, realize that, it's okay, that's one step. And it went on like this because a, a, a schoolmaster of this uh, lower secondary school uh, knew my parents. And from time to time he came around and said, you have to have this boy really go on. He has to study. And my parents said, yes, but you know, we don't believe in that. That's not in our panorama, this, this sort of... of uh, uh, Higher studies, that's for the bourgeoisie, you know, this, this, this mentality. I think often about it, but, but nevertheless they listened to him, because he was an authority. Uh, and so they let me go on, first to the, uh, not the secondary, or, or the, the higher uh, degrees, let's say, higher uh, years of, of secondary school, but to a sort of combination, where you could become a teacher of primary school, and at the same time, have your uh, uh, diploma of, of high school. You know, this is practical, and at least you have a job. <laughs> this is sort of from step to step. But this man came back and said, yes, you have to go and let him, you know, make the decision to let him go to the university, and wow, this is not done in, in the family. I often, I often think of this uh, uh, personal uh, history, when, of course, you, you an encounter um, immigrant uh, people, often even second or third generation, you have, a s often, not always, but often you have a similar sort of mentality, of course. But we are small people, we shouldn't be too pretentious, and let's be careful, and this sort of thing. Uh, which is n not believing in, in incentives of, uh, you know, if, there, if there's a promise in a person, then let it bloom. No, 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 we don't do that, you know. You, just be modest. That's much better than uh, try and fail, of course. This sort of, of, of uh, mentality, I think, is very strong and takes generations. And indeed, good encouraging uh, people 
authorities, like this, this uh, schoolmaster, uh, to overcome. And in, of course, it's difficult to put that or to, to integrate that in, in, a, in a genuine policy, but I think it's important. I think it's really important. You have to work bottom up all the time, which is, of course, <laughs> uh, an anthropological uh, inclination, uh, you might say. Now, after this, this uh, uh, after becoming a teacher, <coughs> the point was since democratization of, of uh, education was in full swing at that time, uh, well, we, I could go together with a, a couple of, of uh, fellows in, in, in uh, my class, not much, three or four people. Uh, we could move on and go to the university. But what are we going to do there? Because it was not in Antwerp, but in Ghent at, at that point. There was no university of any decent uh, level, let's say, in, in Antwerp. Um, and we were intrigued because we had heard, and two of us at least of these four people, uh, we were intrigued because there was, uh, there had been some news about a new, um, um, a new sort of diploma that was started, that was installed uh, at Ghent University uh, within the Department of Philosophy. It was called uh, Ethical Sciences or Moral Sciences. You have a little bit of that in the French, uh, in France, uh, Science Morale, uh, that, exist, uh, that, that existed for a while, but this was inspired by uh, two professors, in fact, and one of them is uh, Leo Apostol, who's, who was rather known, at least, uh, a couple of years ago, um, who uh, had his, his training as a philosopher, logician, uh, in fact, at the ULB uh, in Brussels, with Chaim Perelman, who was a very well-known person in rhetoric. Uh, beautiful work, I think, really impressive work. Uh, he was world-known. An apostle studied with him and then was sent to uh, Karnap. It's quite a name, of course, in, in so-called neo-positivism, logical positivism. And afterwards to Piaget, who at the time was uh, quite a figure, of course, in, in genetic uh, psychology and genetic epistemology, a, a line of thinking which is, was new in, in theory of knowledge and epistemology. So he, was, he knew a little bit about the world, let's say, <laughs> uh, had uh, international contacts, and he, they set up, these two professors, in fact, the other one was Kreuthoff, um, sociologist historian, they set up this, this uh, new program as an interdisciplinary uh, training uh, on ethical issues with philosophers, yes, but also with uh, economists, with sociologists, with biologists, with uh, an anthropologist, uh, and all these together and in, in uh, correspondence with each other, of course, had to think up and, and fill in uh, a training in, in ethics which was really revolutionary and at that point you have two or three other initiatives like that in, in the United States, but that's it. So it was quite impressive and we were, uh, it was just started two or three years I guess uh, when I came uh, to Ghent. So that was attraction on the one hand, this is something new, this is very intriguing, very interesting. Uh, on the other hand, when we came there, um, or when I came there at least, and I heard uh, people like Apostle and, uh, uh, speaking about uh, philosophy and what he thought and, and others in, well, at a lesser level, let's say, uh, as well, what they thought was, was relevant, important, etc., in terms of questions, of issues, and how philosophers had been treating this for 2,500 years, let's say. Uh, everybody starts with the Greek thinkers then, uh, uh, my first reaction already, or very early on, I had the reaction, yes, it's very interesting, but it's very strange. The people I know, in my background, somehow they are not fitting in there. They're absent. And that's strange. How come? Don't they think? And apparently they have been absent for 2,500 years of thinking. And that's strange, really. And those who came before, 
uh, the pre-Socratics, they are like, you know, uh, rejected because they're not serious system thinkers, let's say. And that's strange again, because they solve problems, they help people in, you know, surviving uh, better and that sort of thing. But they were considered to be, you know, uh, not system thinkers, so not serious philosophers. Same with the the, uh, the humanists, let's say, and the first humanist, uh, Vico, Montaigne, etc. There's no system in Montaigne. So, you know, you can't do anything with it. In comparison, Kant and, you know, these are big buildings and that's thinking. Uh, but there was this frustration. The people I know who survive and who apparently survive in very difficult uh, uh, situations like a war, huh? um, how come they are sort of left out? And how come this, this uh, ideal form of thinking, which is detached, which is like uh, a, a, a very, um, how shall I say, learned uh, discourse and only the learned discourse, uh, referring to each other, uh, as playing to some extent, which is really nasty, I think, sometimes, with uh, logical correctness, with, you know, consistency, this sort of thing. Yes, but consistency for what? In function of what, you know? Consistency as such is an authority. Why should it? Where does it come from? From theology, of course, basically. But people didn't say that. They said, this is really thinking, of high thinking or something. So I felt uneasy about this. Now, with uh, an apostle, for example, you could uh, talk about this. Of course, he felt uh, very much at home, uh, notwithstanding Piaget, who was, of course, also empiricizing, if you like, uh, this, this uh, philosophical uh, field uh, in, in his way. But apostle, in, in a lot of things he did with, with uh, Piaget, was opposing to that. He was the classical philosopher, logician, who always, you know, introduced consistency rather than that's how it grows in children. He's, he's, he was not anti-empiricist, but he felt very uneasy also as a personality with empirical things. This is, you know, this is everything and nothing. You, you, don't, you don't have a system in reality, right? It's, it's escaping you and it's, you know. So he felt, as a person, I think, uneasy with that. Okay, maybe later I can come back on that because we had some uh, funny, interesting experiences uh, along this line. But well, he was open enough and saying, you know, yeah, maybe there's a point. And so finally, when I, I uh, graduated, uh, I was considered one of the, well, possible uh, researchers. And uh, I said, yes, but you know, I've been reading a little bit of, it was not much, but there was a little bit in the library on, for example, Chinese uh, philosophy. Uh, Granet, for example, in France, and of course uh, Needham, who I came to know afterwards, Joseph Needham, was a monument of a man, uh, literally also as a person, a really an imposing person, <laughs> but very funny and, and very, mm, I think, close in personality, in character or something, close to the way I deal with uh, things. Strange, but well. Uh, uh, they wrote a lot, they studied a lot on, on uh, uh, Asian and, and especially on Chinese uh, philosophy, of course, and we had some uh, books uh, from them, and I had read them, and I said, well, why isn't it not in, in, in the curriculum? Because the Chinese have been thinking, apparently. I mean, they built a Chinese wall, they had huge irrigation works, when we were still here, you know, in uh, deep, dark uh, Middle Ages, and we hardly knew anything about, you know, beyond the village, let's say, this, this sort of... And, and look at them. They had hundreds of kilometers of irrigation works using their algebra, which existed apparently, but nobody talked about this because, you know, that's not the tradition of thinking of philosophy being the Western one, starting with the Greeks, etc. And then you have, if you start looking, start searching, you find that elsewhere in the world, of course, uh, to begin with in black Africa and its influence on Egypt, on ancient Egypt, but also in uh, the Americas, apparently people had been thinking and doing great things and building great things. And so why is it not in our curriculum? <laughs> 
when we speak about ethics and about uh, philosophy and about epistemology, it's purely Western European. How come? So I had this reaction and I went with it uh, to Apostol, who was then uh, in a jury uh, who would decide on, on the eventual uh, money for me as, as, as a, a doctoral student. And he said, yes, yes, uh, hmm, I can see your point. And I said, yes, but I want to do that. I want to investigate that. In fact, referring to the people I know are not in your way of looking at the world. And that's a missing link. I mean, this, this sh should be treated because you're speaking in universals all the time about humanity, about men, mostly men, not women, but well, let's say humanity then. And it's only European uh, humanity that you're speaking about. And even there, it's only a sort of what you consider to be the top layer, uh, top layer of, of thinkers and their systems thinking. And why? Why this choice and, you know, how relevant is this, etc., etc. Very uh, deep, difficult question, I think, pretentious maybe, but in a sense obvious. Why is this? Bottom, uh, sorry, uh, top-down uh, treatment, in fact, why is this so strong? Now, this was the time when, uh, when I was a student, there was student revolts, of course, and I had been active in them, like, well, most of the, the students in, in, in social sciences and philosophy. And we came to know this sort of, of we, or we, let's say we matured in, in, in this sort of uh, critique on, on our tradition, on, on Western dominance, etc. at that time, 68, 69, this was a turning point. Most of it, I think, was not really thought through afterwards in, in, in the years, because the curricula at universities stayed what they were, basically. I mean, there was some... Uh, amelioration to be sure, but it's not fundamentally decolonized. It's only starting now, this, this decolonization. And even then, rather uh, slowly, I think, but at least it's an issue now. It wasn't yet, uh, well, 50 years ago, with the student revolts. It was still a Western battle, let's say, uh, on authority, on uh, gender, also as uh, sex and gender and, and this sort of thing which is okay on, on bourgeois uh, and, and uh, other social classes a little bit. But I think it well lingered on, but was not really thought through with well, okay. But maybe I was uh, encouraged at least by this, this atmosphere to uh, uh, propose this, this sort of, of um, perspective for my doctoral studies. And Apostle said, well, you know, it's interesting uh, what you're saying here, but you will probably only find uh, trivial things <laughs> if you go and, and, and look for this sort of, if you, you go and develop this sort of question, this sort of research line. But it's okay. We'll, we'll uh, let you have a go at it if, if, you know, there's a chance that you get sponsored for it. So, in the first instance, I made uh, two PhDs. Uh, uh, this was possible still at that time, now it's, it's cancelled. It's still there in France and in uh, Germany, I think, but not in, in uh, Flanders anymore. Uh, first an ordinary PhD, let's say, uh, which was um, basically done uh, on literature, so I couldn't get away. It was not foreseen, it was not done, let's say. Uh, but meanwhile I was, was uh, with a set of young colleagues at the time, uh, also starters, we did a lot of, of um, huh. uh, well, we had a, a, a very active research group um, uh, working on, on epistemology, on, on uh, this uh, interdisciplinary perspective uh, as well, uh, with philosophers but also historians, linguists, etc. It was, it was very intriguing, very good to see how people uh, were busy uh, organizing their research and uh, coming from a frame that they were, of course, uh, taught, try to sort of break it a little bit, at least break out of it a little bit, which is never easy, but 
it's good to have that experience, not just talk about it from an, a distance, let's say, but live it at the same time. And some interesting things came out of this. For example, uh, this, this uh, becoming more and more acquainted with uh, uh, genetic psychology, the, the Piagetian line, and uh, for me personally at least, uh, afterwards, and I think for most of my uh, career, the Vygotskian line, so the, the Russian uh, line, which was very close to the Piagetian line, but less um, maturational, less uh, biologically inspired, much more social culturally inspired. It's picked up in the um, 70s by a couple of Americans, uh, Jerome Bruner and uh, Michael Cole, uh, especially, um <coughs> and then translated in a, in, in a sense and spread into what is now called the, the social cultural pers perspective on learning, on uh, knowledge, etc., which I think is a very, very strong one, a very, very close overlapping in a sense with uh, work that's being done by anthropologists. So I felt at home with them. I've done several things with them, also with the Americans, with Michael Cole and others. <coughs> uh, and of course, we had this 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 source of, of uh, genetic psychology with uh, and epistemology with uh, Apostle, and almost most automatically, with you know the focus on philosophy and social science, and then this dynamic perspective, like. Vygotskian and Piagetian uh, perspective on epistemology, on knowledge, uh, came the idea through Apostle at that point to involve uh, Prigogine and uh, Stengers, Isabel Stengers, uh, on a broader view, a Darwinian in a certain sense, view on, on um, epistemology. So, an evolution, uh, evolution concepts which are broader and which are based, uh, of course, in, in, in that case on natural sciences rather than the social sciences like uh, Vygotsky and, and, and Piaget. And that's when it this culminated, let's say, at a certain point, that was in 84, 85, I think, in, in an uh, international symposium uh, on evolutionary epistemology, where we had these uh, different perspectives together in order to speak about uh, an empirical, epistemology. And again, Apostle was there and was participating, but was very, very hesitant because, you know, empirical, that's all and nothing. You have no structure. And uh, yes, you have a structure, but it has to be, you know, it has to develop bottom up. And he, as a deductive thinker, of course, logician, wanted everything from top down because then you have, you can master your uh, thinking, but <laughs> bottom up is, you know, all and everything. But it was fruitful, I think, and it was really very intense for everybody, which was nice. René Tom was there as, as a, a mathematician then uh, with his uh, catastrophe theory, and Darwinians and uh, psychologists like, like uh, uh, Campbell, who uh, wrote a piece on evolutionary epistemology in a famous book, uh, uh, Donald Campbell, in a famous book on, on uh, <coughs> what's his name again? Yeah, well, I forget. Uh, so it was quite intense because you have indeed these masters of thinking at that point. Huh? Prigozhin uh, got this Nobel Prize only a couple of years back. And they, let's say, were very mature in, in their uh, field, in, in, in their uh, research topics and met people who were mature in a slightly different, slightly overlapping uh, uh, research um, line. And that's, if, if it, you know, mingles in an interesting way, then you have something and you have a feeling like, oh wow, something is happening here. Which may not be, you know, deductive in any sense, maybe afterwards somebody can find a system in it. But it's very productive, it's, it's wonderful. And everybody was really, you know, felt like this was a very, very, very interesting experience, including Prigozhin, who was, who was a very, you know, not a simple man to, to satisfy, let's say, but well. So this was very, uh, a very nice experience. 
that we as little guys, we were young researchers, um, I'm speaking about the two of us who, who, who uh, organized this conference, one was Kalabaut, who had a Kalabaut, who later went to Vienna and there became the, the director of the uh, Lorenz uh, Center in Vienna, uh, the Konrad Lorenz uh, Center, uh, <coughs> for the rest of his life. <coughs> but working along these lines of biology, evolution and philosophy, social sciences, in an interesting, very, very interesting, uh, well, high-class uh, center. And the both of us, we really uh, put together this and were very satisfied that this was possible. Now, I go a little bit deeper into this because this was a very fruitful uh, time. I think it was a very fruitful time, and there I'm becoming a little bit anthropologist uh, already, uh, because of the context. So I always love to point to the context, also for philosophers. You're not thinking what you're thinking because it's, you know, bright and brilliant or, or genius or whatever, but because you live in a certain context. Even a genius in the a, a wrong context will not be a genius, but a failure, this sort of thing. So that was the, the, the focus, I think, that, that emerged before 90, 1990, 1989, if you like, the fall of the Berlin War, uh, and 1990, the, well, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you, you might say, when of a sudden, but really of a sudden, things changed in the West and certainly in Europe. You had the Bologna uh, Agreement, uh, just the beginning of the 90s, and our uh, Chancellor at that point, set of Chancellors from Europe, came together and said, from now on, it's finished with all these adventurous sort of things. You have to manage research. You have to bring in money, you have to say what would be the output, etc. So it changed rather abruptly, and I think that was a mistake, generally. I mean, for some ripe fields, you can do that, you know, be more manager than, than researcher for a while, you know, to develop things uh, until they are really exhausted or something. But to manage the whole system of universities and research from the point of view of business, to hire, for example, CEOs, which is happening now in big universities, they hire CEOs as chancellors rather than researchers. I think that's a mistake. Yes, of course you have business then, but is this fruitful? What is the perspective? What is the novelty? Where do you, you know, uh, encourage uh, uh, people to, to dare new things, etc.? This really is shut down in a terrible way, I think, over the past uh, generation.